Hello BookTube. I saw just just today uh, that Sean the Book Maniac, all the way over in Japan, did a used book haul. He unhauled a bunch of books from his collection. I don't think he watches my channel anymore. I don't think anybody watches my channel anymore. Uh, I, I, he unhauled a bunch of books, and uh, I always wince a little when people unhaul books. Uh, and he brought them to his used bookstore and got store credit and exchange them for a bunch of other books and then the natural thing you do if you're a booktuber is that you make a video about those new books so he did uh and it was fascinating i couldn't help but notice that uh he got exclusively fiction when it is after all non-fiction november <laughs> uh and uh i thought i would do the same thing uh i i had a somewhat uh overshadowed uh last 24 hours i had had a, a rather deep digging pain uh, uh, in my back, amidships on the port side, <laughs> uh, and I didn't know what it was. I thought maybe it was a pulled muscle of some kind. It kind of, sort of, sometimes felt like that, but sometimes not. And uh, I, I have a whole bunch of medical friends, <laughs> so I asked a medical friend, you know, what is this? I, and he said, you know, describe it to me in great detail. Describe it in elaborate detail. So I did. And uh, he said, well, <laughs> uh, you're passing a kidney stone. You are certainly passing a kidney stone. You're in the very early stages of it, but you are passing a kidney stone. And, of course, I blanched in horror because I've heard nothing but horror stories about passing kidney stones and how painful it is. And he said, well, there's good news and bad news. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, okay, <laughs> sock it to me. He said, the bad news is, the good news and the bad news is the same thing that the pain you were in yesterday is the least amount of pain you're going to be in for the week. <laughs> that is just, that it, the good news is that that was easy, and the bad news is it gets much worse from here as the pain moves. And yet, today, that pain is largely gone from me back. And it hasn't moved anywhere else, so I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what to expect. Uh, oh, hello, baby. I got pee. <laughs> What'll you do if I pass a kidney stone? <laughs> What's that, baby? That's a tripod. Oh, hello. You're so pretty. You're so pretty. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I thought that, uh, well, you mean this, this morning that, that most of that pain was gone. So uh, to celebrate, I went to the Brattle Bookshop here in Boston. So I have my own used book haul to show you. <laughs> I'm not slavishly imitating Sean, uh, although I am going to slavishly imitate him here just a bit. Another thing he did in addition to showing the books... He got Hazard of New Fortunes. Can't wait to see what he makes of William Dean Howells. Actually, that's the wrong way to put it, because he's not going to finish. He's going to bail on William Dean Howells. And what I mean is I can't wait to see how long it will take him to bail on William Dean Howells. But I could be wrong. Uh, but anyway, another thing that he did in his video was to read the beginning of each of the books that he got. Uh, and I don't, I don't have Sean's reading voice. Almost nobody on BookTube does. And I don't have his ability to leave the text up to edit the text into the video, but I thought I might do the same thing. Uh, maybe not just the beginnings, but uh, let's see here. So the first, Frida, do you mind? I'm making a video, and you're going nuts. Do you want to see your friends again, or just want to keep biting me? Oh, baby. Here, let's put you on camera again. There you go. I keep... <sighs> She's two. She shouldn't be bitey anymore. And yet, she is. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> You just settle down. No, you just settle down. I'll be yours all day. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. I tell her, you can't bite me for the next five minutes. And she looks at me like I'm giving her away <laughs> to a passing gypsy or something. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, this first one's going to take a little bit of love and care to fix up, but I'm good at that. So, and, and I'm not going to resell it. So, uh, it, this is Diana Capel Smith, and it's a book called Wintering. And it is illustrated by the author. It's, there's illustrations all throughout, and they're quite good, uh, where she does the illustrations herself. And at the time that she wrote this book, uh, she owned a 275-acre working farm in northern Vermont. And this book is about wintering in Vermont. Those of you who are not familiar with America <laughs> may, may not know uh, what that means. When, Vermont is a wintry state. It's a cold state. We have a few of them uh, in America. And... Uh, Working on a farm, you know, Vermont is also very, very rural. So if, you, if you're on a 275 acre working farm, you're far away from anything that might be considered a convenience of civilization. <laughs> uh, so it's going to be interesting to read this thing and see, because I missed it completely when it first came out. I think it came out in the 80s. Um, uh, 
Yeah, 19, uh, 19, uh, looks like in the mid 80s, 85, something like that. Uh, but I, I won't read you the beginning. I, I, I turned just at random to something and I liked it so much that I wanted to read you there. Uh, here, the turning of the year is announced by owls. I need it announced. The furnace sucks in wood as fast as I can remember to put it in. My hands are full of splinters. I'm not sorry for myself. I'd rather be here and cold than down south and warm and not having mountains and needing to lock my doors every night. Still, I'm really warm only when I'm in bed, and even then, my one hand that's out in the open holding a book feels as cool and smooth and foreign when I turn out the light and pull it against my chest as the white ceramic jug full of orange juice that sits in the fridge. This isn't my hand. No, this is a white ceramic hand. I need to know that things will change. The singing of the great horned owls in the swamp is my signal. I hang my hat on that peg as if I had arrived in May already. <laughs> I like that. And I think I'm going to like the rest of this book. So that is that is wintering. Uh, then the next book I got is a work of history, ancient history. I have had this before. I, in fact, wrote about it. Uh, I don't know if this is my copy that made it that made it to the Brattle Bookshop. Uh, it doesn't have any of my marks on it, and it's in terrible shape. So if it was my copy, it sat in their basement for quite some time. Uh, but actually, let's see. Let's see what this is. This is... Oh, no. Oh, my. It has a pub sheet in it. So that... that uh, this is the paperback release uh, from 2010 of Barry Strauss's book, The Spartacus War. A very, very good, uh, very readable one-volume account of the Spartacus Revolution and all of the Roman, uh, the Roman Pubas that tried to do something with it. That tried, it's, a, it's virtually a who's who of, uh, of Romans, Crassus and Pompey and all of these, all of these famous uh, citizens and generals and whatnot that, that took their, their turns at trying to beat Spartacus. Uh, and I, I, didn't, I didn't actually mark a, a spot here to... Uh, actually, am I, am I blurbed in this thing? I don't even know. This is terrible. Uh, let's see here. Oh boy, that's a ton of blurbs. I don't think I am. I'm not. Sh I'm not 100% sure that I reviewed this. Uh, no, it doesn't look like I am. Let's uh, so let's just see how it starts. That's how Sean did it. He started. He read at the beginnings. Uh, so let's see. Lucius Lucius Cassinius was naked. Senator, commander, and deputy to the general Publius Verinius. Cosinius usually wore a full suit of armor and a red cloak fastened with a bronze brooch at his right shoulder, but now he was bathing. A bath was a luxury in wartime and no doubt hard to resist after leading 2,000 men on the march. As he approached, Cosinius could have seen the pool glistening in the grounds uh, of the villa at Selene, located on the central lagoon near Pompeii. In a distance stood Vesuvius, still sleeping volcano in those days, its green hills with pine and beech trees, its orchard overflowing with apples and its, with grapes that made wine good enough for a senator's table, its soil teeming with hares, dormice, moles that the locals favored as hors d'oeuvres. So we have a nice quiet beginning to, uh, to what will be a raucous book. I remember liking this. Uh, I'm going to have to research now and see what my experience with it was. Did I review it? Uh, but I know that I don't have it, and so I'm glad that I'm glad that I got it because I'll, I'll want to give it a read again. Uh, then uh, the next two books are biographies. <laughs> I was looking for biographies. I always am, especially since they're so cheap at the Brattle Bookshop. Uh, and the first one I got is uh, part of a multi-volume biography set. They occasionally biographers are struck with the urge to do multi-volumes. And I don't know if you, how many of you have read multi-volume biographies. It is an experience. It is an experience. It is. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would actually advise that you not miss it, even if you don't make a habit out of it, like some of us do. <laughs> I would. I would advise that you not miss it. It's a strange, immersive experience to read an author's multi-volume biography of one person. To spend that much time with one person, especially if you wait and read the whole series after it's all come out, instead of one volume at a time. Uh, and this is one of the most famous of them all. This is James Thomas Flexner's biography of George Washington which he did in multiple volumes. And I, you might remember what this, what this sort of looks like, the red, white, and blue cover, the black spine. I got, uh, and also showed you in a biography tour, uh, one of these volumes, uh, George Washington in the American Revolution, which was 1775 to 1783. This is actually the next volume in the series, in perfect condition for a dollar. I wasn't going to pass it up. Uh, 
Flexner is famous for writing for taking these this multi-volume Washington biography and condensing it into one volume, Washington the Indispensable Man. Uh, but the, he's really good with the extra detail. He seems more uh, at home in these volumes. They're extremely readable. They're extremely good, no matter what I think of their subject. And this this deals with Washington from 1783 to 1793. This is him in you know first in full Cincinnati mode, where he has won the war. And he goes home to Mount Vernon, and he is looking there to relax, be at peace, be a landed gentleman, and die fairly early. Uh, and then he gets the call. That is at least the popular version. The popular version does not admit of the idea that Washington was angling for the call. We must not say that. <laughs> although, I, although if I remember correctly, Flexner does sift all of the evidence and, and flirts with that idea. So you, I, I'm looking forward to rereading them. I haven't read these books since they were coming out. Uh, but Washington gets the call that, you know, there's there's going to be a new government, there's going to be a new constitutional convention, there's going to be a president. Eventually, when, when the new constitution is ratified, there's going to be a president. Somebody's got to be first. And it's got to be you, because you're the only one that everyone loves. So it, you, we can't... If we can't, we will doom the country from the beginning," said a couple of people, including one person from Massachusetts. "We will doom the country from the beginning to partisan strife if we start with partisan strife. And you're the only figure in this country who is not partisan, who is an active politician. I guess Ben Franklin could have been our first president; might have been a better country for it. Uh, but Washington couldn't refuse, even if he hadn't been an ambitious, place-seeking poltroon. He still couldn't have refused. He wasn't a horrible person, except to his slaves. <laughs> Founding Father Virginians. No matter what you say about them, you then have to add a comma and then say, except to his slaves. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm looking forward to this. This is this is fine grain biographical detail. This is, you know, 300 pages for 10 years. And I like that. And that that is the kind of experience that you get in a multi-volume biography. You get that kind of focus that you don't get in even a thousand page doorstop of a book. And sometimes that pays off, depending on the author, depending on the biographer. But, I mean, you uh, some of you have probably seen Mark Richardson on his channel. He has the, the Dumas Malone, uh, Thomas Jefferson books. And there are many other, many, many other examples. We saw on this channel the three volumes of Reiner Stock's biography of Kafka, who didn't die an old man. So, And there are plenty of others, plenty. <laughs> Paige Smith did one, a two-volume biography just on John Adams that I wish I had. And a bunch of others. And they are an experience. They are a, a weird and oddly fun experience. <laughs> so, uh, But then the next biography that I got is one of the greatest biographies uh, written in, uh, in American literature in modern times. And it's a one volume. And when I was doing my library tour of biographies a million shelves ago, I noticed, as made a, sort of a mental note, that I didn't have it anymore. I must Every time I get a copy, I give it away. I always end up giving it away. So I found it, and I'm going to try not to give this one away. <laughs> this is uh, uh, Robert Richardson's book, Emerson, The Mind on Fire, uh, which is going to need, it's got a bunch of ingrained dirt on the cover. It's going to need a little, all these are going to need a little loving care. But this is, this is his great biography of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, and it's, it's not a multi-volume, and it's just so incredibly thoughtful that, uh, that no matter, again, no matter what you think about Emerson, I think I, uh, I like Emerson a lot better than I like Thoreau, uh, but I still went into this book thinking, eh. Yeah. And then it blew me away. I absolutely loved it. It is a great biography, a great work of American biography. So, again, for a dollar, I wasn't going to pass it up. It will, those two will go on my biography shelf. Uh, and then the last thing uh, for today was uh, the treat, was the highlight of the day for me, as silly as that is. It was all, these are all nonfiction. I'm still counting these as nonfiction because these are New Yorker cartoons. I've said before how much I love New Yorker cartoons. I consider them to be a universal language, just an amazing phenomenon. Uh, and there's one particular New Yorker cartoonist that I love more than any other, and that's Helen Hokanson, who did a series of, of cartoons starring, <laughs> starring slightly overfed, slightly overdressed, completely clueless, and adorably flouncy uh, upper society New York matrons. <laughs> they are absolutely wonderful. They are, it is wonderful to spend time in their company uh, because they are so innocent. They are, I wrote about I wrote about one collection called My Best Girls, and today at the Brattle I found the collection that came immediately after My Best Girls, When Were You Built, <laughs> which is the title. It's going to sound a little strange. Again, it's a clueless question asked by one of these two women. 
this is, these are those are two of Helen Hokanson's classic women on the cover. They are in a, a, a picturesque seaside resort where every house has a colonial history of some kind or other. And what they mean, what are ladies, they are asking this of a hapless housewife in her garden. And when they say, when were you built, what they mean is, when was your historic home built? But that's not how it comes out. <laughs> and this is just full of uh, of cartoons like that. And you might think, uh, well, do, you have you have you know the Hokanson Century or whatever the Hokanson Holiday, so won't all these things and everything in My Best Girls be in here? But that's not always true. Uh, sometimes things get cut for space, and they, the only way you're going to find them is going to be in in the individual volumes where they occur. Uh, and this is just this is so delightful. This, there's there are two of our two of our women greeting each other on, on the on the commuter train, and the the caption is. Well, if your husband isn't going to be at Hot Springs either, we can get into all sorts of mischief. <laughs> and these, these ladies can't get into any mischief. They, they, but nevertheless, they can get into stuff that they would call mischief. <laughs> uh, or this one here. There's, see, there she is with a shop attendant down there. <laughs> and, and the, the uh, caption is, I, would, I wonder if I could enlist your cooperation in a little scheme I have for livening up my husband. <laughs> I love these things. This is in terrible, terrible shape. Uh, so I will I will give it loving care and put it on a shelf that now has three Helen Hokanson books. I don't know how many there are, but the, the, I've got to be close to the, to the finished number. Uh, so there you go. That is a, a non-fiction November used book haul so that I'm not like Sean letting the side down. <laughs> so uh, so I'm going to I'm going to go for now. I'm going to clean up these books and give them some loving care, bring them into shelf worthy attention. I'm a little bit hard on my books. So I, I don't want to, uh, like for instance, something like this, it's just a, a normal dust jacket. I don't want to uh, put it on the shelf and then ha be pulling it off and putting it on for six years and, and have it torn to powder. Instead, I'll reinforce them now uh, so that they, they can last a while. I'm hoping that all of these things will end up in my permanent collection. That's the goal of any trip to a used bookstore, although not Sean's. I noticed that Sean was doing a lot of exploring. It's it's always fun to see. He was doing a lot of exploring on his used bookstore, buying authors he's never read before, buying the books he's never heard of before, just to give it a try. That's a lot of fun. I've done that at the Brattle many, many times. Of course, when the Brattle sale lot books are a dollar a piece, it's, it encourages you to do that. But I'm kind of, I'm like Helen Hokanson's Best Girls. I'm kind of slimming. <laughs> I'm trying to slim down my collection. So what I'm really looking for is, I mean, I'll do some some. You know, experimentation here and there. But what I'm really looking for is books that are coming into this room. The Helen Hokanson is for sure. Uh, the the Mind on Fire and the Washington book will will stay in my biography collection. Who knows whether or not I'll really love Wintering. And I think the Spartacus War is also a keeper. Uh, that's kind of what I'm looking for. I wasn't doing any experimenting today. Uh, but who knows, maybe next time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to wrap this up uh, and go see what was at the door. <laughs> Every time I make a video, the doorbell rings. I get a lot of mail. <laughs> We'll see. So I may be right back. Thank you, BookTube.